Hi guys, this is Steve Moss, pastor at Boulevard Christian Church. God's mission for us here at Boulevard is really simple. We help people find Jesus and we help people follow Jesus. And our teaching team hopes that this message that you're about to listen to will help you learn to grow and trust Him more than before. If it does, would you consider giving a gift to Boulevard to help us carry out the mission that God has given us? Thanks. We hope your heart is fully open to what God has for you in this message today. Good morning. Question for you. Ever had anything so dear to you that you had a difficult time putting it into words when you tried to explain it to someone? Like, a bass boat. Now, I'll, I'll tell you that I said that first, first service, uh, not one person laughed. And I thought, I really am in Oklahoma, and that bass boat really is precious to someone. So uh, it was intended to be funny. But anyway, so have you had something? Have you had something in your life that's so valuable to you that when you try to explain it to someone, you try to put it into words how special it is? Well, in, in, Luke, in Luke 7 that we're in this morning, uh, Luke 7 contains a little known story, and I would tell you that it is one of my personal favorites. It's possibly, probably my favorite Jesus story in, in the Gospels. And, and I would give you just a little bit of look kind of behind preaching and that is, at least for me, and that is that I have found over the years that those passages and stories that are the most important to me, maybe the most impactful in my own life, I somehow find to be the most difficult to preach because of this situation that it's, it's been made such a difference in my own heart that I have a hard time putting words. And as I was preparing this, this, this last couple of weeks, I realized I was having a hard time searching for words. It just didn't seem like they, I, I could find the word that would mean and have them the, be full of meaning like I hoped it, it would. And, and I, would, I would tell you this, uh, if, this, if this message feels a little autobiographical to you, uh, it is, all right? If, it, if, it, if at some point in time you feel like it's, it's about me, uh, I, I promise you that is not my, uh, there's a little bit of my story in it, but I really, my prayer has been, my hope is that, that this will be, the, that the, the glory and the, the light will be completely on Jesus uh, through this, uh, whatever stories I, I might share. Uh, that's, that's, that's my hope. So, having said that, have you ever been in a place where you felt like you were hanging by a thread? Time in your life when you feel like you're hanging by a thread. Time in your life where you're at that last, that last thread. The last day with the clock counting off. And all the options were out and you had tried everything you had. The last bit of money in the account with checks, bills coming in. Ever been in a place where in your marriage there was that last ember of love? Sick. And there was the last treatment, the last option, the last conversation over something you've had multiple conversations about. Think about that, if you would, for a second. Go back, kind of go back to that moment. Hit pause. Think about some of the emotions that were there in that situation, how you felt the desperation in that situation. A couple of weeks ago, I met with my, uh, with my doctor, just had a kind of a routine appointment, and, and, and he uh, was looking through my records, and he hadn't been my doctor very long, and he said, I noticed that you have two stents here in your heart, and uh, he said, what's that about? And he said, tell me what that's about, and, and he, he asked the question, and, and all of a sudden, I felt myself going back to my last thread moment, and my last thread moment uh, was um, one of them in my life. This time happened about eight years ago, and, and I woke up on a Friday morning, and I had gone for a little bit of a run, and I had eaten some breakfast, and I came out. Somebody knocked at the door. I came out on my front porch. A neighbor was showing me that I'd had some damage on my roof from the night before, a tremendous hailstorm, and, and uh, we finished our conversation, and I walked back in, and my chest began to hurt, and I thought, you know, it didn't hurt a lot. It just hurt, and, and um, 
I thought to myself, you know, must have pulled a muscle or something, whatever, a little ache. And, uh, and so I just thought, I'll just walk it off and we'll see what happens. And I, about five minutes went by and, and it didn't get any better. And so I walked in, I thought, no, you know, I probably ought to tell Dawn that, that my chest is hurting. <laughs> Good decision. And so I went into, that, went in into the bedroom, you know, and I said, hey, just so you'll know, no alarm, you know, my chest is kind of hurting, all right? Um, and, and so she is alarmed, you know? And, uh, and at that point in time, I was still pretty much just thinking I just had, you know, just a little muscle pull or something. Well, then about that time, I start breaking out in a cold sweat and both my arms go numb. And then I thought, you know what? I don't think this is a muscle pull, right? I didn't even have to call Doc Med on that one, all right? I, I made that decision myself. And so all of a sudden, all of a sudden, I was thinking, okay, this is kind of serious. So she's getting ready, and I go in the kitchen, and, and the ambulance comes, and they put me in the back of the ambulance. And there was a little, like, security for me, and, like, the ambulance is here. When the ambulance is here, like, they're going to do something, and this is all going to be a lot better. And, and it wasn't. And so we're driving along the way, and there's this guy who's obviously like maybe his first hour ever as an ambulance medic, and he's nervous, and he's trying to get this little package open with these little nitro pills, which are just about this teeny, and he looks at me, and he goes, Mr. Moss, when I put this pill in your mouth, within minutes, you will be feeling better. Great. That's what I want. So he puts the pill in my mouth, and within minutes, he goes, so how are you feeling? And I said, it actually hurts a lot more than it did several minutes ago. And so I go, I get out, and I, they roll me out of the ambulance, and my friend, Casey Fishburne, has already found about it, and he, he beats me there, and so I look up, and I see his face. And then this guy leans over me, and he goes, uh, Mr. Moss, he said, um, he said, I want you to know that we are gonna take good care of you. I was like, that would be good, too. I'd like some good care. And so, so I did not realize it at the time, but the man leaning over me who told me I would receive good care was a man by the name of Dr. Marvin Padnick. Now, Dr. Padnick was a cardiologist. He had come to Muskogee. A couple things you probably need to know about him. One, that he was the only person in town at the hospital who was trained to put stents in in the middle of a heart attack. The only guy. Second thing I would find out later in on was Dr. Padnick was not supposed to be at the hospital that day. He was been sick or something anyway. He was, for some reason, coincidentally, he was there and and he took me in, and they did a procedure, and they put a couple stints in my heart, and my heart, I immediately started feeling good. Here is an understatement. I like Dr. Marvin Padnick. Okay? I love, I love Dr. Marvin Padnick, and I'm just gonna tell you that if Dr. Marvin Padnick came in onto the platform, or, in the, or if I found out he was in the building, I would run to him, and I would be awkwardly affectionate with him, okay? I would put my arms around him, I would hold him awkwardly front to front, and you all would be going, whoa, too much, and I was like, I don't care. This guy took his gift and I believe he saved my life. And I found out since that I had a, a complete blockage in what is classically known as the widow maker and another. And I probably had about 18 minutes before things really started getting ugly. I love Marvin Padnick. He's my man. Um, those two small stints that he put in over eight years ago, they remain in me as a reminder of what he did. But more than that, they are actually provide the lifeline in the sense that allows the blood to flow through my body and keep me alive. Now, Luke 7. I, I'm not sure exactly what Luke's intentions are in Luke 7, but it begins with three stories of three very different people with very different needs. And those me needs we're gonna find are met by Jesus now, one of the things I love about this, and as we read the gospel, and as you're reading Luke, that you're going to find out there, there, God and Jesus, they do not fit in a box. And we're going to see this even in Luke 7. Three very different people, three very different kinds of needs. And the beginning and the bulk of chapter 7, Luke 7, is Luke showing these three different people that he meets, that Jesus will meet, but they have something in common. Each has a very, very specific life-affecting need, and they are out of options, and they are helpless. What's more, each knows it. 
And so Jesus has done his teaching and he leaves the mount and he goes to Capernaum, a place called Capernaum. And there he's gonna find this man. Uh, actually, he doesn't see him. There's a centurion there, a Roman centurion, a man who was over 100 soldiers. You had to be kind of a special kind of dude to be called to be a Roman centurion. And it says that he has this highly valued servant and he is dying. He is on his deathbed. And so he sends these elders to see, to see Jesus because he finds out Jesus is going to come. And he says, hey, listen, just say the word and this guy will be healed. You don't even have to come to my house. Interesting that his people he, sent, he go, sends to Jesus actually say, hey, this guy is worthy of having you come to his house. And yet the centurion says, I am not even worthy of having you come under my roof. Well, a couple things you need to know. One, I think this highly valued servant is one of those kind of people that you just trust, that you feel like you can't do without. He's the kind of person that you, you can leave for a couple weeks and just know everything's gonna be good at the house. Think Potiphar and Joseph in the Old Testament. He's the kind of person possibly that, that you would leave your kids with, the highly valued servant you can't go on. The, 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 the household can't go on without this guy. And so what we find about it, out is this. He says, say the word. The centurion says, centurion says let, say the word and let my servant be healed. The centurion's faith is something Jesus marvels at. Think about this. His faith made Jesus say, Whoa, whoa, dude. I mean, how'd you like your faith to like wow Jesus? Put a smile on his face, make him a little giddy. That's a pretty cool thing. And the person that did it in all the New Testament was this guy who's a Roman centurion. That's pretty exciting. The second thing is, hey, before Jesus ever got there, he obviously said the word and that servant was healed. Yeah. So second serpent situation. Jesus goes from Capernaum to about 20 miles southwest to a place called Cain. And when he goes to, or Nain, excuse me, he goes to a place called Nain. And what you find out is that there's not only the apostles are following Jesus, but a pretty large crowd. And so they're walking into Nain, and as they're walking into this village called Nain, there's this funeral procession coming out. And Luke does what Luke does so beautifully. And just in a matter of words, he gives this description that gets us an idea of what is going on there that there's a young man who has died. This is his funeral procession. A young man, he was the only son, Luke says, of his mother who was a widow. Now, if you know anything about culture at that time and day, if you know that, that women, if they did not have a man or a son to take care of them, life was gonna get really harsh really quick. They did not have protection. They did not have provision. So you can imagine, if you would, you can imagine the casket of this young man and his mother, his mother doing what any mother would do, grieving, sobbing, touching, touching the casket, what, thinking about her grief, but also the fear that's in, gonna be in her future of who is gonna provide for me, who is going to protect me. And it says that Jesus walked up, and as the centurion's faith filled Jesus' heart with marvel, now the widow's grief and fear fills Jesus' heart with compassion. Luke gives us this beautiful view into the heart of Jesus for you and I as we have needs. And Luke 7, 13 says, and when the Lord saw her, he had compassion on her and he said to her, do not weep, do not weep. And he touches the casket and the procession stops. And he speaks to the corpse. What do you think the crowd does when he speaks to the corpse? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. What does it do? Doesn't really matter because at that point in time, this man who was dead and long dead sets up in his casket. Now they got something to talk about. Right? And that man young man begins to speak. Now moms, what does a young man say after he raises up out of the casket after days? Hey mom, I'm hungry. <laughs> right? I'm hungry. That's what young men say all the time. Jesus has met her deepest and greatest fear, her greatest needs. 
And he, and he takes, it says he takes the son and gives him back to the mother and, and she receives back her protection. She receives back her provision. She receives back her company by the fire on those lonely cold nights. And Luke goes to John the Baptist. John the Baptist who is a man who has seen Jesus, he has heard Jesus. He's a cousin of Jesus. He has baptized Jesus. He's had a lot of time, a lot of face-to-face time with Jesus. And yet now he is in prison. And so in prison, we don't know what happens, but he sends a couple of his disciples to Jesus and says basically, hey, are you really who you say you are? Which is a little strange because he's had all this face-to-face time with Jesus and he's seen Jesus do his thing and he's heard Jesus' message. And it seems a little strange to us, doesn't it? I mean, that's like, why? Like, you, you should know of anybody. You should know who Jesus is. Think about that. Uh, think about how often that, that Jesus has done at some point in time in your life something pretty amazing, if not miraculous, that he has showed up in a crazy way to meet a need of yours. You have pled for him, and he has been there to meet a need, and yet even days later, you're just going, I, I, I just need to know you're there. Are you still here? Are you still who you were? It, it reminds me sometimes like, you know, when our raising our boys and our, our grandkids and sometimes the grandkids come to the house and they would sleep and maybe they might be having nightmares and I, and I would lay, sometimes just lay on the floor next to the bed and I'd, you know, I'd touch them and say, Pops is gonna be right here. But they'd wake up maybe an hour later and you could hear them begin to cry. You know, and Pops, Pops, are you there? I haven't gone anywhere. And all it takes is me just put my hand up on the bed and touching an arm, a reminder. And that's kind of like John the Baptist. He hadn't left. He just needed some assurance because he was in prison and he, and he didn't know what awaited him. But he needed to know, hey, listen, if I'm going to continue and my disciples are going to continue to do what you've called me to do, I need to know that you are really who you are. Because if you're not, I'm not going forward with this. I'm losing courage quickly. And again, we, we have been there. We have been there. And Jesus says to his, uh, John's apostles, tell John what you have seen and heard. The blind see and the lame walk and the deaf hear and the dead are raised to life. Take that back to him. That'll give him some confidence. So who can you relate to in this? Can you relate to that centurion who, who, who is about to lose something or someone that they, they feel like they need for life to go on? How about, the, how about the, the, the widow? Can you relate to her? Provision, protection. Can you, wait to John, can, you, can you relate to John the Baptist? There's another story. Now, the story in Luke 7, and I, this is the one I would tell you is my favorite, and I, I see myself in it. I see myself in it. When you read some of the writers who have written about this, they use words like this. It's a story in high definition. It's full of the gospel. It is one of Luke's great paintings. It is sheer artistry. And that story begins in verse 36 of chapter 7. Chapter 7, and it says this. One of the Pharisees asked him to eat with him, and he went into the Pharisee's house and reclined at the table. And this man, we're going to find out, is a man by the name of Simon, not Simon Peter, the apostle, a Simon who is a Pharisee. Randy shared with us last week a little bit about the Pharisees, that they were religious leaders, Jews of that day. They were deeply respected in most senses. They spent their life studying and teaching the scriptures. And kind of their, their, what they did was they would take something that was a sin, kind of of the day, something that we shouldn't be doing, and they would build a fence around it of like, this is the way you stay away from this by not doing this too. Because if you go over this fence and you're gonna be closer to the sin, then they would build another fence. And that's how they got all those ridiculous laws that Randy shared with us last week, building fences to keep people from sin. It wasn't such a bad thing. It just got absurd after a while. That's who Simon is, one of those Pharisees. Now, something else you probably need to know, but we walk into the passage any further is this. This Simon invites Jesus to his house. And in that day and time, there were a couple of things that if you invited someone to your house, this is what absolutely happened every time. That the, 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 the owner of the home, 
okay, the host would maybe put his hands on the shoulder of the guest and he would give him a kiss of peace. He would say possibly shalom, meaning peace between us, peace into your life. And then he would take water, he would have a servant take water and he would wash the, the feet of the guest because his feet were dirty and stinky because that's what this, the roads were at that point in time. He would have someone put a drop of balm, some kind of oil on his head to kind of just probably for, for scent because most of those people out in the sun stunk, right? And so drop of balm can't do any harm. And none of that was done for Jesus. None of it. Done for everybody else. But for whatever reason, it wasn't done for Jesus. So Jesus enters Simon's home and he reclines at the table. The tables at that point in time were very, very, very short tables, about like this. People would lay at the table with one elbow down and they would feed themselves with the other hand and their feet would be out behind them. So that's the picture and Jesus was there. And behold, a woman of the city who was a sinner, when she learned that he was reclining at the table in the Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster flask of ointment. And that seems weird that a woman would just, a, a stranger would just walk into the house. But again, at that time in that culture, most houses were built in a square and there was a courtyard in the middle and they were open air for the most part. And so to have a guest come off the street into your house was really not that strange of a thing. And that's what happened. Hospitality is an interesting thing, isn't it? Having people just show up at your house. When I was in high school, I had this friend of mine and he had brought up in a single parent family and his mom worked a lot and probably didn't do a lot of home cooking. And so, so... Um, my mom would make fried chicken and mashed potatoes and gravy, and she made it good. Having, I haven't eaten much better fried chicken than my mama's. Uh, and, and Vic somehow could smell my mom's fried chicken from like two to three miles. And he would just show up at the door like unusually on the days that mom had fried chicken and he would do the thing you're like oh no I couldn't as he was walking towards the dinner table you know and mom always welcomed him you know and somehow made enough you know and he would sit at our dinner table and I, I I've always loved the hospitality I saw in my mom and welcoming people this woman does not get that welcome Matter of fact, I would say that it's probably safe to venture that, that she knew that as she was going into this house, there wasn't going to be that kind of welcome, wasn't going to be welcome at the, the table, that instead, that instead she knew that she was going to have to undergo all kinds of, of looks, looks up and down her body, looks of mockery. Luke Luke could rush this moment. Luke could just brush past this right into the next whatever, but he doesn't. And I think he doesn't for a very important reason. Here's what he writes. And standing behind him at his feet, weeping, she began to wet his feet with her tears and wiped them with the hair of her head and kissed his feet and anointed them with the ointment she finds where Jesus was and she goes there mocking glares and whispers and she stands behind his feet as he is reclining at the table. You ever ugly cried before? You know ugly cry? You know ugly cry. Ugly cry, not pretty cry, not a few tears, not a little <laughs> ugly cry. I mean, like, like, like nose running cry, sobbing cry, shoulders heaving cry. I can't speak any because I, I can't get my breath. My, my throat is parched and you can't get any words out. Your throat is burning and it's closed up. You know, ugly cry. You've been there before. I think this is ugly cry. I think this is ugly cry. And she falls to her knees, but it's not planned. And it's not groveling. It's grateful. She has come to anoint Jesus. 
but something then happens, something much, such, something much bigger than she thought might happen. She, she, all of a sudden, in his presence, in his presence, she begins to become more aware, an awareness of who he is and what he is. And because she is in his presence, it's become aware of his, who he is, she begins to become fully aware of who she is. And that only really happens when we allow ourselves to come fully into his presence. In her mind, if you can imagine it being filled as a video with all kinds of crazy ugly, terrible images of her time in the past. And she senses his purity. And her own impurity becomes incredibly vivid to her. Whatever was planned when she walked into the house, a simple, simple anointment of his seat is now all gone. And her tears fall to his still dirty feet. For he is the son of God, but his feet still stink. And she takes her hair and she lets it down, which would have been a disgrace to do in public in that culture, but she doesn't care. And she wipes his feet, dirty and stinking, with her hair if you can imagine. She continues to sob. And she wipes maybe her nose with her arm. Can you? Can you close your eyes and imagine that? I mean, if you're there, are you a little uncomfortable with this at this point in time? Like, okay, that's, that's enough. That's, this is a little awkward. Pull it back a little bit. She doesn't care because she is in his presence and in his presence she knows now who he is and she senses his love for her even though he knows exactly who and what she is. And all the plans fall by the wayside and there's a vulnerability and a transparency that allows her, knowing who he is and who she is, to completely give herself to him. She reaches for the perfume. And the perfume that has been used to lure men into a bedroom is now used to anoint the feet of Jesus. Jesus does not stop her. Now you would think that maybe he would go, oh, that's okay, honey, you're, you're okay, that's enough. No, because he knows what she has done. He knows she knows what she has done, and he knows he is the answer. And again, this is not groveling. This is an anointment of thanksgiving these are tears of gratitude. And Luke, Jesus is not stopper. And, he, and Luke paints this very, very vivid picture with words and senses. Now with contrast. Now when the Pharisee who had invited them saw this, he said to himself, if this man were a prophet, he would have known who and what sort of woman this is who is touching him, for she is a sinner. And I think Simon, I don't know, maybe he's at the table, maybe he's standing I see him standing, but we know this about him. He didn't have a clue who this is that he has invited to his house. She, he says if he were a prophet, he would know. And Jesus has just preached a sermon just the chapter before, just days before, where he has turned the kingdom of God upside down, and Simon's world and his religious world is still very much religious right side up. And verse 40 says, and Jesus answering said to him, Simon, I have something to say to you. And he said, say it, teacher. Now, one of the only other people who actually called Jesus just teacher 
is the rich young ruler. I don't know if you know that story, but he's a man who walked away very sad, never realized who and what Jesus was. Say it, teacher. Watch this. You gotta see this. In three sentences, in a three-sentence parable, Jesus cuts right through. A certain moneylender had two debtors. One owed 500 denarii and the other 50. When they could not pay, he canceled the debt of both. Now, which of them will love him more? He goes right to the core, doesn't he? Right to the core. Verse 43, Simon answered, the one I suppose for whom he canceled the larger debt. I suppose. Don't you just want to pop this guy in the face? I suppose. I suppose. Smugness. And I can just imagine that he looks at his friends with this arrogance. Jesus says, you have judged rightly. You have judged rightly. And now we go from observation to to application. Then turning, verse 44, then turning toward the woman, he said to Simon, do you see this woman? I entered your house. You gave me no water for my feet. She has wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You gave me no kiss. But from the time I came in, she has not ceased to kiss my feet. You did not anoint my head with oil, but she has anointed my feet with ointment. Can you hear that? Maybe it's just me. But I think as Jesus speaks in the background, you can still hear her sobbing. You can see her. You hear her. You smell the perfume. Are you ready for this? Make sure your heart's ready for this. Therefore, Jesus says, I tell you, her sins, which are many, are forgiven. For she loved much. But he who is forgiven little loves little. This morning, what does Jesus want for you to know about him? That more than anything in the world, He just wants you to love him. You got that? He just wants you to love him. And when we see him for who he is, only then will we be able to see ourselves for who we are. And only then, like the woman, will we be fully aware of our need for him. And that he alone is the answer. And we will come to him with that same vulnerability and with no conditions and nothing in our hands. And it is out of that, my friends, that real and strong and authentic and growing and joy-filled and life-giving love is born. Only in that awareness of who he really is leading to me seeing who I really am. I have a need. Jesus, you are the answer. He will have said in Luke 6, blessed are the poor in spirit, those who have complete need of me, for they will see God. And our pride, my friends, man, our pride and self-righteousness will keep us from seeing God for who he is and for who we are. We will not see our need. Thus, we will not believe we really need him. And what is the result? Is that our love will continue to remain weak for him at best. The one thing that will keep you and I from loving God with all our hearts is self-sufficiency. And Jesus' harshest words were not reserved for those that we think that they often are. They were reserved instead for those who were self-sufficient in his upside-down kingdom. The crazy thing is that the closer one follows Christ, the more aware he is of, our, of his sin. 
in his need for Christ, our need for Christ. And, and the more we are aware of that as we grow closer to him, the more unabashedly in love we grow with him for forgiving that sin and meeting that need in our life. Jesus and what he has done remains in you, giving you life and allowing you to continue living in the same way that those stints in my heart do me. And that woman shows us beautifully what love looks like. She gives us this beautiful image, this picture of love. She focuses, as Jim said a couple weeks ago, she focuses not on the gift, but on the gift giver himself. And she has this intentional act of vulnerability. If there's anything in this whole story that just moves my heart when I read it, it's this incredible vulnerability that she comes. She just doesn't care what others are thinking. She loves him for what he has done for her. And there is a trust there of who he is that he will not turn her away. And there is a sacrifice of herself and whatever ego there might be there and a laying aside of self-sufficiency. And man, that happens. Oh, my friends, that happens when we come into his presence. Whether it's just a time of quietness, being still, whether it's opening the scriptures as we go through and we go through the book of Luke and you do that and, and you see, begin to see in the scriptures who God is and you respond to that. Oh, that pleases him so. He wants you to know him so that you can love him. And a challenge for the church, for this body of believers, if you are here today, that Luke makes clear again already that the gospel is for all and I'm telling you that you are dealing with at the grocery store and you are dealing with at the bank and you are working across the street or across the hall and you are living in the cul-de-sac with someone who needs Jesus, whether they know it or not. And you know something I realized? I realized that, that Dr. Patnick was the one who leaned over and said, hey, we're gonna take good care of you. And when he said where, he meant it. Because all of a sudden, they wheel me in the hospital, and guess what? I look up, and there's like literally like eight or ten people just all over me doing, I mean, like all kinds of stuff, prepping my body for this procedure. He used the team. We are that team that God will use to take him to them. You are that person. You are a member of that. He will use you. Folks, when your own need for Jesus is real, like the centurions, like the widow, like John the Baptist, the woman at Jesus' feet, they knew they had a great need and they knew he was the answer. And God desires, he desires your love. We try to give him so much, he just he wants us to love him. A love that results and comes from trust that's born out of us experiencing him and his presence. He wants to hear you and I say these words. I need you. I think those words provide pleasure for him in a way that, and delight in a way that we can't even fathom I think it's good for our lips to hear us say, even if our mind and our heart is saying, I think it's good for us to hear ourselves say, I need you. Do we have somebody over in this section? You can say it quietly. You don't have to say it. You can say it as loud as you want. Will someone say those words that might encourage someone next to you? Would you just say, I need you. Will someone in this section just say those words you know, quietly, as loud as you need to? Between you and God, I, I need you. Is somebody in this section, can you just between you and Jesus, it can be a whisper, as loud or soft, soft as you need it to be for your own heart to believe it, will you say, I need you? 
and over here. Can someone just say, I need you. I need you. They are life-giving words. And they are the words that Jesus and the Father want to hear from you. I need you. You can put your own need behind it if you want to. Sometimes I just say, God, I just, I need you. That's what he desires, for you to need him so he can meet your need and that you will love him. Let's say it together. I need 